Stardust is probably one of the coolest codenames we've encountered, and it's attached to this top secret AMD test equipment that we've managed to get a hold of. These are incredibly rare to find in the wild, so to speak, where test equipment roams and hides from people like us. So this has a few modules we're going to be looking at today. These are very important for design and development of anything using AMD large socket CPUs. So that would be Threadripper, uh, it would include Epic CPUs. They date back to 2016, but there hasn't been a lot of coverage of them until now. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lexar's Hades RGB RAM. Lexar's Hades RAM is available in DDR4-3200 and DDR4-3600 options and specializes by allowing LED synchronization, including for color, intensity, and speed changes. Lexar's Hades is looking to compete on both quality and price, and the RGB LEDs allow for easy matching with any build's color profile. Learn more at the link in the description below. This story started actually a couple years ago, and we saw a lot for what was described as lot of AMD load generators and emulators, and that was interesting to us, so we bought it. Uh, this is clearly an AMD SP3 socket size chip. It's not actually silicon, but these are used for generating loads, and they're used for testing things like how well your new cooler would perform on Threadripper before Threadripper actually exists, before it's taped out at the fabrication facility. That's what all this is for. You could also use it for determining how your motherboard performs. You can use it for calculating the power that is actually provided to the CPU via software. We'll talk about the formulas for that later. Now, when we got this, Googling AMD Stardust would barely return any relevant results. There are a couple of AMD LinkedIn profiles listing proficiency with the tool. There's some poor lost manufacturer asking for help on the AMD community forums. Not really the right place. There's scattered import and export records at different governments, and there's an article from an R&D company, Dada Tong, which casually drops an image of a Stardust system in use. And all of those results are probably going to get buried by our video as soon as it goes up. So let's go over what we got a hold of here on the table today. We have three main modules, a couple of attachments, and load pods, these are called, load generators. And uh, it'll be a fun sort of provenance piece for AMD enthusiasts, but also just really interesting from understanding how the industry designs products for silicon that doesn't even exist yet. So let's go over what we got here. First of all, this is an ALM. This is called the SDLE2 underscore SP3 ALM. What this means, so SDLE stands for Static Dynamic Load Emulator, the, the two. <laughs> Not sure what that means. It's probably the second generation. SP3 is the socket. And uh, this we're going to talk about in more detail in a moment. But this you can see is attached to a basically a CPU. Now, there's no actual silicon in here, as we said earlier. Instead, this is the full pinout for what eventually became Threadripper or first gen Epic. This particular unit was last calibrated in 2016. So that's right before Threadripper came out. And on the opposite side here, you have a distribution plate. This is functionally an IHS stand-in, integrated heat spreader stand-in, so they can socket a cooler onto it and do some initial dummy heater testing for CPU coolers on this, uh, on what eventually became Threader for Epic. This just plugs into some modules we don't have. Go over that in a moment as well. Over here on this side of the table, we have two other things. These are identical units. These are for DIMMs, so these specifically are identical AMD Stardust DDR3 DIMMs, and they are also SDLEs, or Static Dynamic Load Emulators. And you can see here that they are hooked up to some memory modules. These are DDR3 modules, uh, even though Threadripper supports DDR4, Epic supports DDR4, for purposes of generating a load, this was sufficient for their needs. Now, a lot of times, load generation is done with MOSFETs. You could use resistors, potentially use ASICs. Uh, typically, they don't use actual sort of functioning memory silicon or CPU silicon. It's, it's all emulated, and that's intentional. It's to get it out the door faster so partners can start designing their products before the CPU is actually made, which takes the longest to get done. On the back of this, you can see a number of uh, scope monitoring hookups and the cable that runs to, ribbon cable that runs to the memory module. This sockets into a motherboard we don't have. On the side of it, there's some relay hookups. There's a USB cable that would 
hook up to your computer so you can control this module via software plugged into a normal computer. And we actually have a lot of screenshots of that too. There's some input output. There's a power connection for a barrel plug that we unfortunately don't have. And then on this side, there's a screen readout and you've got some basic LEDs for troubleshooting. So power, uh, I guess it's probably connection. There's a warning LED and then there's an error LED and then just some holes cut in for venting. So we're missing a few pieces of this system, but we have the most interesting pieces. These AMD documents we managed to dig up, show a photo of the full kit. We're missing number one, the SDLE2 main unit, but we have the DAM and the ALM connector shown as numbers two and three. We also have some of the load pods, the memory modules we showed earlier would be one of those. We're missing the power supply, which means we can't turn it on, unfortunately. We're missing the heat sink brackets. We could make those if we had the power supply though and needed them. And critically, we're missing the motherboard, which is shown as number 12 here. So the simplest thing that can be done with Stardust is to apply a load to the power rails at a set current. And there's four rails that are supported by Stardust hardware, or you could go up to eight if you had two dams paired. You can see there's the dam connector right here that would connect to another dam connector for the dam unit. Now again, we can't power it, but we do have the software if anyone were to supply us with power for this, and we were able to find documentation showing the software. AMD software has dynamic and static modes, which matches the SDLE naming. In static mode, output values are displayed in two lists of eight entries, each in the Stardust interface. And to be clear, all of this documentation we have, we found. One for current is located in the software, it's prefixed with I, and one for voltage prefixed with V. These are named based on the hardware present. So there's VDD or IDD, IDDP or VDDP, IDD underscore SOC or the SOC current. There's voltage for the SOC and so forth. Static current load for each of these rails can be set in a menu to the top left in the software shot. VID to the power rails can be controlled with the menu below that. And then these rails correspond with the four VMON or voltage monitor and the four current sense out headers on our SP3 ALM. So all of this equipment actually first came to our attention when Hardware Info 64, the software, started working with the Stilt to produce a power reporting deviation metric. This is going way back. You might remember our coverage of it, but just to recap it quickly, basically, Hardware Info 64, it's really good software. It takes its best guess at what power the CPU is actively consuming. But it wasn't accurate, or at least not initially on most motherboards. The reason for that is because there was a skewed reporting deviation, which Hardware Info later added a percentage to clarify for users. So if you saw your power consumption said 100 watts, and then Hardware Info said power reporting deviation 170%, you know that 100 watts number, it's not accurate. It needs to be multiplied against the deviation to figure out where it actually is landing. And this is all old coverage that we did a long time ago now, a couple years old. Now that coverage is still worth watching for its own sake if you haven't seen it, just to get you up to speed. But a couple things, that was an excellent example of why this type of hardware is useful, why Stardust is useful. And it shows us a few things like telemetry reference current in the stilts words, or telemetry gain factor. So telemetry reference current or telemetry gain factor is a static number determined per model of motherboard. During operation, the board's VRM controller passes the CPU current telemetry numbers from zero to 255, and that's then multiplied against the reference current to get the actual current in amps. So if the motherboard manufacturer specifies an incorrect TRC value, the CPU will report to hardware info that it's drawing more power than it actually is, which was the whole problem and why power reporting deviation came in to begin with, and also what this stuff is supposed to fix. But not every motherboard manufacturer has one of these, so what they could do instead is send their product to AMD to get time on an AMD lab uh, dummy load like this to then determine the numbers. If They don't always do that, which is why we have the problem, but they could do that. So if the board manufacturer sends a representative to AMD's lab to test three or more board samples, they would run them through a test suite scaling from zero to 100% of the thermal design current, or TDC. And some of the methods for using Stardust are crude. This, for example, is how AMD's official documentation suggests its manufacturers who spend $6,640 on each Stardust unit remove the load pod from the motherboard. And uh, 
we're not going to use that method today, mostly because we can't power this on. Otherwise, we would use it. But if we look a little closer here, so you can see on this unit, there are actual mounting holes where you could mount this to, first of all, this would go functionally into a motherboard. It would go against another one of these, and then you could mount the cooler to the top up here. They, of course, in the manual recommend applying thermal paste to this. It's not an IHS, and it's not an actual CPU, but it's going to get the manufacturers close enough to figure out if their design is going in the right direction for their coolers. For example, making sure the cold plate covers the whole area versus not. And in fact, let's actually grab a Threader per CPU to compare. Just for comparison purposes, here is a Threader per CPU. This is a 2990WX, and you can see patterns are very similar. Not quite the same. It's missing, of course, the capacitors down there, but otherwise it's pretty similar. If we take off the orange sort of loading mechanism, gives us a little more freedom to position it, and it's actually almost sized exactly. A little bit off, but for something made a year before these CPUs, actually many years before this particular one even shipped, that's not bad. Now for the IHS, well, it's not quite the same, but uh, the intention is that they can at least get a large surface area to test on. And all of this maybe helps explain why when the Threader Per Coolers first launched, we really only had a couple options that did well. There were the Enermax ones, those were good, and then they gunked up and were terrible and actually the worst coolers that were made for Threader. But they did well originally. There were the Noctua ones with the larger cold plate. That actually worked really well. But for the most part, cooler options were extremely limited for Threader for when it came out. Uh, servers have it a little easier in that regard. Now, for the rest of this, so Stardust allows setting a precise load current and then monitoring it via the monitoring plugs, which you can see here you have VMON and then the rails one through four, and then current sense out one through four. So the value gets reported back by the VRM controller, which should scale linearly. And for example, the 5950X has a rated TDC of 95 amps. So let's just use that as a starting point and make up some numbers. This example is completely fabricated. The 5950X isn't even one of these types of CPUs, but the math works the same way. If at 0% of TDC, the VRM controller hands back the number one, and at 100%, it hands back the number 200, then at 50% of TDC, it should hand back the number 100. In this example, the full scale current would be 121 amps, and the gain factor, or the TRC, would therefore be 0.475 or 121 divided by 255. The motherboard manufacturer would then bake this TRC value into firmware, which you're actually seeing happen at a motherboard factory we toured previously on the screen right now. If everything went correctly, then every time the VRM controller reports a number, that number can be multiplied by 0.475 to get current of a 95 amp CPU. And that number can be multiplied by vCore to get power draw in watts at any given time. So that's one highly specific example of what Stardust can do, but it's representative of the tool in general. Static dynamic load emulators are dummy loads that can be precisely configured, and the way motherboards handle that load can then be measured and adjusted to meet AMD's spec. Intel has its own equipment for performing these same tests, and their tools are known as the voltage regulator test tool. Unlike AMD, Intel has a lot of its test equipment out in the open on its store page, including some especially cool items like thermal test vehicles. So the all-in-one form factor of the DDR3 units appears to be an older style, while the SP3 unit is part of a newer system. This is the one known as SDLE2, and this is probably SDLE just blank or one. We were able to dig up some import records for these. So these modules were calibrated in 2016, and these modules were last calibrated in 2012, and their copyright stands for 2011. A Threadripper didn't launch till 2017, and the memory it could have been in use for a long time just because it's DDR3. Let's open a couple of these things up just while we're working on them. If there's no thermal adhesive here, then we'll pull it apart. And if there is, I might might keep it together. Let's see. Cool. So there's what it looks like underneath. This is just an aluminum heat sink. Pretty simple one, really. It's got, uh, it's not a thermal pad. It actually, it used to be thermal adhesive, but it's old enough now that this is all dry. This is, this is over 10 years old, this particular module, just as a reminder. So this thermal adhesive is, is long since dried. Or if it was a thermal pad, it's now a very flat thermal pad. So it might have been like a one mil or 0.5 mil thermal pad. Either way, uh, what's underneath it is this unit. So what we can see here, there's actually no memory modules on here. There are no DIMMs. 
And we can show you an example of some DIMMs on the screen for another, an actual memory module. But these are just MOSFETs. It's a common heater type. You can use these for dummy heaters. And uh, the other option typically uses resistors. So that's all that is. These can be programmed to go to a, a set current or a known voltage, and then you can test your heat load. That's what that part is. So for the next stuff, the size and shape of all of this necessitates special mounting hardware. And it also has a the load pods here, like this is a load pod, this is a load pod. These particular ones are only rated for 75 degrees Celsius anyway. And as fun as it would be to use this for our own thermal testing for thread ripper coolers, it just makes more sense for us to use real thread ripper CPUs now that they're out because ultimately uh, these are built in a way that we'd have to get custom hardware so it just wouldn't represent the actual shipping units. Let's open this one up. I think this is just a plastic shell. So here's the inside of the Stardust SDLE2 ALM. Uh, there are actually jumpers on here, too. What do those say? So those jumpers say, oh, it's just rails. Uh, it says, for example, rail 2 DAC loop drive. Underneath it, it just says rail 2 loop drive, no DAC. And that's repeated all the way down for different uh, rail numbers. So that's what those are. Andrew, behind the camera, is asking me what ASCII barcode is. And um, you use your imagination. It doesn't stand for assembly. Okay, a couple probe points on here. There's, I think that's what this is. Feel free to correct me in the comments. But we've got a seven volt in the ground. Uh, let's go ahead and get this opened up. Does that come off? Ooh, it does. Designed in Bangalore. Oh, there you go, right there. As you can see, so that's the terminology we've been using. Load pod connector, and that connects to the cable that goes to the actual load pod, which is the SP3 CPU dummy. I can see hot glue in the assembly, which is how we know this is a real engineering product. So simple shell here. It honestly, looks like it might just be 3D printed. And on the back side, we've just got more uh, circuits. And actually, in the bottom left here, this one, AMD Copyright 2012. Now, of course, they could print whatever date they want on there. but Probably that's around the year this was made. So if that's the case, this is more modular and interchangeable, and it's actually just the load pod itself that needs to change, which makes these very easy to design on because they'd only need to swap certain parts as things age. So that's the inside of the ALM. Let's go ahead and just take this apart, too. It's not like we can use it anyway. And just to be clear with everyone, this won't damage it. It just opens it. Okay, so taking this one apart, all right, that was easy enough. Wow, this is all, you can tell how long this has been in service when you don't even have to pry it apart. So that's pretty cool. So under here, you, as you can see, it's all MOSFETs like we expected, and they're distributing it fairly evenly. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent they, the manufacturers or AMD can control individual regions of this, if at all. Feasibly, you could write it in such a way that you can program sort of quadrants to distribute the load and, and check for if you have different active uh, CCXs or core complexes, things like that, versus, for example, two dummy dies that just support the IHS, which is what we saw in some of the early ones. Uh, this is just the plate, and it's got a very small either thermal adhesive or thermal pad that's been worn in well underneath. I'm thinking, I don't know if this is, this is probably, oh, I don't know. They might not necessarily do that by pick and place machine, but it look, kind of looks like it. Uh, a lot of this, though, looks like it's done by hand, which makes sense because it's low production volume. So let's set that one aside. Just put this back the way it was. Let's look at the last unit here. This is the load emulator for, in our unit, the memory modules. And if you want to grab one of our toolkits to take apart your own AMD Stardust, you can do so on store.gamersnexus.net, or to take apart other stuff that you actually have, like video cards. I'd be in trouble if, if I only sold them for Stardust, but they're compatible. Uh, one other side. It's five screws on this. Not counting the fan. This also appears to be 3D printed. It's just a plastic shell. Aha. Uh -huh. I can see where the previous owner has cracked it, and I will not fall for the same tricks. So here's the inside of the chassis. It's just got some 
light bars basically for the LEDs to shine through. So this is pretty cool. This is the inside of the memory dummy load. On the right side here, we have a simple fan, just two cable fan. Looks like about 40 millimeters or so. And just out of curiosity, it's a 0.09 amp 12 volt fan. Not particularly powerful. That just pulls some air across the board. And then over here we have international patent XXXX. Oh yes, that is the, uh, the most highly sought after patent number, quadruple X. Very well known. Anyway, so now that we've seen the secret patent uh, heatsink holder, I will attempt to remove it. Actually, there's no point in me removing it. All it does is sit on top of a heat sink. But it is sitting on, this is actually sitting on top of a substrate with some silicon on it. So um, there's something a little more interesting there. So this is just the screen. Let's just go ahead and remove that. So this is really, it's just an, it's an LCD. It's not that interesting. Underneath, we've got some Xilinx silicon. That's interesting because uh, AMD ended up going on to buy Xilinx. So I guess they get some use out of them internally for stuff like this. AMD now owns the company. They didn't when they built this, to, as far as I'm aware. This is maybe a little too old for that. Uh, underneath, honestly, it's just some more, it's, it's a couple like firmware chips and things like that. Nothing too interesting. Some jumper uh, headers, and then that's kind of it internally for this thing. So not, not too crazy interesting other than the Xilinx Spartan module there. So that's it for most of it. Some final information here. There are actually socketed BGA load pods as well. So this thing's fairly expansible and you can do more with it if you're in development. The uh, AMD community post we referenced earlier actually talked about needing FT4 and FT5 BGA socket support. And they included a screenshot to AMD's top secret catalog for manufacturing partners only. It's the AMD community forum. It's basically one step below Reddit. And as you would expect, nobody in the forum knew what the hell the manufacturer was talking about when they posted all this. Probably AMD wasn't too happy either if they ever found it. Now, as for those BGA APU modules, that actually gives us some context for a leak back in 2017. We had to dig this one up. The leak stated, uh, it contained some phrases like Stardust adapter mod and Stardust and EX load, adapter and EX load. They showed up several times in the 2017 leak. No one really seemed to notice them. They were more interested at the time in the Vega leaks. I don't really have anything else to say after that because Vega, and we mostly all know how that went. Uh, the DDR3 kits are each connected by ribbon cables, and you could add more of them if you happen to have one of these. But ours, obviously, is basically functionless without the power. And that brings us to the last point, which is if you happen to have a power adapter cable to run, uh, to turn on specifically the DDR3 SDLEs, or even to get a whole SDLE2 to use with the SP3 uh, ALM that we've acquired, then reach out. You can email team at gamersnexus.net. We'll see it and we'll try to get one from you. We looked into custom making some cables, but it would just be easier to source something. And as for why we didn't get the last few pieces, our understanding is that AMD actually holds several of these pieces in their labs. So like in Taiwan, for example, where a lot of the motherboard manufacturers are located so that the manufacturers have to go to the lab with other pieces of equipment to run the testing, which helps keep it under lock and make sure people like us don't end up with it. So anyway, that's it for this one. Pretty fun stuff. Really more interesting for my history piece and look behind the scenes of what AMD is doing for its testing and uh, unique content for sure. So if you'd like to see more of this, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly with buying stuff to review or look at independently, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like some bonus videos and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.